All right. So as I said, um, welcome to the first session of the 2022 seminar series for um, the Discourse Consortium. Um, thank you all for coming on a either Friday or Friday evening or Friday night, or maybe it's only Friday night for me because I'm in Australia. Well, I'm just gonna share some slides as I take you through um, session for today. Um, so in the um, 2022 seminar series, welcome again. And in this series, we are trying to look um, at doing a series of talks, one a month for most of this year on different aspects on um, speech language and psychosis research. And just to, you know, refresh everybody's memories. Um, so the Discourse Consortium is the diverse international scientific scientific consortium for thought language and communication research in psychosis as as of today we have 151 registered members which is excellent across you know all of the world and all six continents minus antarctica um if you want to find more find out more details and if you've never been to a discourse um consortium seminar before um welcome if you want more details um, we have our website discourse in psychosis.org or feel free to follow us on Twitter for more updates at, at Discourse in Sci. Um, the link is just right here. So there's a lot more details, especially within the website. We have details about the seminar series. We have details about all the activities we're going on with. And so we very encourage you to um, come on board. And just an introduction on um, discourses. So in about, about almost two years ago now, um, the group of about eight of us here. So Emery Bora, myself, Gina Cooperberg, Iris Summer, Lena Paliniapan, Maria Francisca Alonso, Natalia Mata and Wolf from Hinzen got together talking about trying to come up with a more cohesive approach to the research of um, thought language and speech and psychosis in order to answer a lot of the questions I think we all had in common but then we could do better at answering together. <laughs> and, and so we decided to um, pull discourse together. Our very first um, meeting was supposed to be at the 2022 um, SIRS conference, but of course that was just before the world ended and then we could not do that, but we managed to do it online and it's been quite successful so far. Just a summary of activities um, that we've done. You know, we did a seminar series last year, which was very, very successful. And so we're back for season two this year. Um, which, and then the other thing that has been really good is we actually got to meet in person this year at the Schizophrenia International Research Society Conference in Florence in April. And to do two symposia, which if you attended SERS and you're a registered member, you'll be able to actually still access right now. And also a couple of presentations in terms of talks and posters. Um, the other activity that um, we're actually getting together is Speech Bank, which is, the our endeavor to actually try and homogenize and get a big database of speech data across the world across different languages and different cultures and so if you're interested in potentially taking part in this um, endeavor that we're doing um, please get in touch with discourse through twitter or through emails and um, we can you know try and incorporate you in this work that we're doing but coming back to the seminar series which everybody's here um we're doing one every month like i said across a whole range of different um, topics. So today we're looking at developmental perspectives and then across the year, we're going through a whole bunch of different topics. So generally it'll be about the last Friday of every month up to October at this point, And we welcome you to join us. It's free for everybody to attend throughout the whole year. And so just in terms of the structure for today's seminar, it'll be, we've got two speakers, of course. Um, it will be a 20, 25 minute talk from each speaker and then at the end of it, we're going to have about 10 minutes discussion, five for each talk from both the speakers. And after that, we're going to have a Q&A um, with everybody attending. Feel free to you know, put your questions in the chat at any point during the talk. And then after that, I'll read out the questions. Or if you have a question during the Q&A itself, um, just raise your hand and then I can enable you to um, ask your question um, personally. And again, um, session has been recorded, but I've already said that. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce both our speakers and then we'll get both our speakers to talk and then I'll be back in when the talk's over. So our first speaker is um, Natalia Mota, who is a computational psychiatrist and neuroscientist who got her PhD in 2017 and a master's in 2013 
from the Federal, Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. She is currently a professor of the Institute of Psychiatry at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Um, Dr. Mata is a pioneer in computational psychiatry, applying graph theory to narrative analysis for clinical evaluation of psychosis, dementia, and psychedelics, as well as the study of developmental narrative markers and associated sociocultural factors. She was awarded the 2018 Abril and Dasa Prize for Medical Innovation, identified for, by Forbes magazine as one of the 20 most powerful women in Brazil in 2020 and was the first Brazilian to be named an inspiring scientist by the prestigious scientific journal Nature in 2019. And our second speaker is um, Professor Valentina Babini, who is a professor of linguistics at the University School for Advanced Studies, RUSS in Pavia, Italy. She obtained her PhD in linguistics at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, Italy, with a dissertation on the neural basis of metaphor comprehension. Since then, she has worked as a postdoc researcher in Pisa and Pavia, and as an adjunct professor in Italy and abroad. Her research interests are in the field of neurolinguistics and experimental pragmatics, and are organized in three main areas. The first revolves around the comprehension of metaphors and other implicit meanings in the brain, investigated especially through electrophysiological methods. The second is pragmatic language disorder in adults with psychiatric or neurological diseases. Recently, she has started to investigate pragmatics across the lifespan in development and aging. She has coordinated several projects funded by national and international bodies. In 2022, she was awarded an ERC consolidated grant from the European Research Council for developing an integrated account of developmental of development, impairment, and neural correlates of metaphor processing. And she also co-founded the Experimental Pragmatics in Italy Research Network. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Natalia, who is also a member of our steering committee. And so I'm going to stop sharing. And Natalia, Natalia if you'd like to share your slides, I think we can begin. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, thank you all for attend and come. It's very exciting a moment uh, to, to be here again, talking to, to all of you about uh, this initiative. And I'm, I'm very confident that we can reach out our speech bank um, in uh, several uh, years in advance. And it will be a very nice opportunity to disentangle some issues, some factors that might be affecting uh, the way that we look at uh, those kind of symptoms that we could uh, actually uh, uh, measure uh, through language. So today I will talk about um, the, a couple of research, uh, not only on the, uh, on the topic of psychosis, but also uh, that the, the, the strategy started uh, uh, by, uh, and, and it was inspired by the phenomenology of psychosis, but I will talk to you a little bit about the, the developmental perspective that uh, uh, raised during this path. Uh, and I'm gonna show you why um, I, I think like that. And I wanted to uh, afterwards so we can chat and talk about those ideas. So uh, for start, I wanted to ask you um, a very uh, strange question. Uh, can you um, uh, formulate a concept about an organized mind? What is actually put in words this feeling of an organized mind? It's a very hard task to describe it. And part of the phenomenology if we uh, can get from the interview with a patient, it's part of that. It's trying to translate into words what we feel in this context. But we have this feeling that uh, organized mind is able to communicate itself at inner space through a uh, uh, chain of thought. So we have this, th this idea that uh, uh, a trajectory of ideas or events that are narrated in sequence can formulate and can get together into a common sense. But somehow uh, people like Istamira, this lady that had her life, uh, two years of her life documented in this awarded movie, 
she lived it uh, with her entire life with a uh, disorder called schizophrenia. And uh, in her speech, we can uh, have this feeling of uh, this fragmented mind, this uh, disorganized mind, trying to express a very hard uh, concept also to express that it's this uh, blooded effect. So in a part of movie that takes only 30 seconds, she says, conscious, lucid, and aware, and I have feeling, fine. What gets caught, welcome it, record it is the feeling. Now, for example, sentimentally, visibly, and invisibly transparent format, as I told you already, I'm in a place far away, and I stay far away. It's not because it was translated from Portuguese to the English that it's kind of weird, but it's, uh, uh, she, she was trying to express this feeling that in uh, sometimes we can call it like blooded effect, but the way that she chose the words in sequence makes it hard to understand. And sometimes we have this feeling that we are actually listening to uh, some kind of uh, um, poetry or something like that because the structure is very different. Um, and nowadays we have some uh, computational tools that are able to help us uh, to, 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 uh, to measure those kind of phenomena that we were used to only describe it with words. So uh, I will talk briefly with you about uh, some strategies like, I'm sorry mental organization uh, and how we can get uh, some measurements of that, looking at you, uh, graphs uh, made it from those uh, words trajectories, spontaneously use it by the patients to narrate a story, uh, emotions, and I, I won't talk today about semantic coherence, but also this is a very exciting field in this uh, in, in this sense, and uh, we have a lot of uh, different groups working on that strategy as well. So focusing on uh, the strategy to look into the mental organization through language, what is uh, the, the concept behind it? So uh, in the, this was the first paper that we produced in 2012, so 10 years, I'm, uh, I will pass this entire year uh, celebrating this uh, paper. And what we uh, thought on that sense was that if it is uh, some um, metrics that we can get through the words trajectory, we can listen to the patient, for example, reporting a dream, I was dreaming of a show, and we can represent each word as a node and the link between uh, the words will uh, be, be, be represented as this direct edges so uh, plotting the sequence of words spontaneously uh, through the speech. So for, for that, uh, here, this example is a very simple example. Uh, as you can see, uh, it shows only a, a, a linear trajectory because none of the words uh, repeat themselves during the, the, the narrative. But here we have a, a more complex example when we have some words recurring, because uh, when it repeated spontaneously during the narrative, uh, the, the edge returns to the same node, and then you have the graph, and you can measure a serial metric to um, understand the graph topology. For example, you can uh, measure the amount of nodes. Uh, there are also a proxy of lexical diversity, as it is um, uh, different words in this uh, word trajectory, in this narrative, you can uh, measure uh, the repeated edges. So edges that are linking uh, the same pair of nodes, that it's uh, also a short uh, range recurrence measurement. And you can uh, measure uh, how many nodes participate in the largest strongly connected component of this graph. In other words, 
uh, on those uh, components, you have uh, the pairs of uh, 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 each each pair of nodes is mutually reachable. Uh, the node A reaches node B, and also the node B reaches node A. Uh, maybe not through the same path because here we don't have this direction, but it can take another way to get into the same node because all the pairs of nodes are highly connected. So in this sense, when I'm, I'm talking here about speech connectedness, I'm actually talking about the speech graph connectedness, and this connectedness is linked to graph theory. So uh, we apply it this, uh, uh, we, we build it this uh, software, speech graph, it's available on this website. And we first put it this uh, 60 subjects, 20 subjects per group. So we have a group with a diagnosis of schizophrenia and also another group with the diagnosis of bipolar disorder expressing psychotic symptoms as severe as the schizophrenia group and also a paired control, a uh, paired for education and uh, sex and, and also uh, socioeconomic status. And as we, we ask it, uh, the subject to report as a dream, and as you can see here by those examples, we had a very different narrative when we represented those narratives as a graph. So by calculating only the connectedness measurement and using those connected me measurements to, um, as an input to a, a classifier, to an automated classifier, we could uh, distinguish between uh, schizophrenia and contra group with an area under the rock curve of 0.94 and between schizophrenia and bipolar group with an area under the rock curve of 0.77. This measurement takes into account sensitivity and specificity of this method. So it is important to distinguish and but those uh, patients were chronic uh, patients expressing psychotic symptoms. And uh, but besides uh, uh, better than only uh, guess and classify subjects, it's important to understand why uh, is those symptomatology expressed through behavior uh, associated with uh, those uh, uh, language markers? And as you can see here, we uh, plotted this uh, correlation matrix and the colors are the, is, uh, the, the effect size of human correlation. And each row is a, a graph uh, metric and each column is a symptomatology measured by PANS or BPRS. And as you can see here, we had uh, correcting by uh, multiple comparisons, uh, those significant uh, negative associations between uh, the severity on negative subscales of PANS and uh, the connectedness measurement. So in other words, the less connected the speech uh, the more severe uh, the negative symptomatology. Afterwards, uh, through a collaboration with Elena Polanyapin, we had access to uh, data collected in English uh, in England with a uh, different culture and a different language. And we could replicate the same patterns of differences between schizophrenia and bipolar group. And more than that, uh, Lena's and Peter Lido uh, groups had a very uh, uh, complete assessment of uh, those participants. They applied uh, the psychometric evaluation using the thought language index. They had also cognitive performance, uh, uh, looking at working memory tests and speed up cognitive processing. Also, they tested some um, uh, functionality looking at the gas and sofas, and also uh, looking at neural disconnectivity using uh, functional uh, fMRI, uh, and also uh, uh, jurification index. Uh, and but, and we, we added through this analysis, uh, one minute uh, report analysis using the speech uh, connectedness, uh, apply it through uh, to the narratives of the pictures use it by the scale. And uh, what the, the, they had was uh, some associations between the behavioral measures. 
but none of the, those behavior measures were associated with the a neural signal. But when we added uh, the speech connected analysis that adds uh, more precision on this evaluation of this linguistic behavior, we could uh, find an association uh, between the language markers and all the behavioral tasks, as well with the neural signal. Uh, so subjects like Samira could actually add some complementary tools like uh, speech graphs, not only to understand what they wanted to express with, through their narratives, but actually adding some information about this uh, structure, this language structure thing by uh, representing this word trajectory as a speech graph. But uh, as I told you, uh, something that colored our attention was to look at this developmental perspective, because at uh, the field that we are in, we have uh, an opportunity to look at psychosis in the first early stages. So we have here a developmental perspective uh, through this perspective of the, the disorder. So here we apply this technique at the first uh, sick, seeking of uh, the participants to, to some kind of clinical help. So uh, we uh, ask it, uh, the participants at their first clinical appointment at the service to uh, narrate uh, uh, some, some kind of story and represented this narrative as a graph. And as you can see, and we, we follow those subjects uh, for six months and we just open it, the narrative, after the follow-up. But this, since this first appointment, we could uh, measure that when they uh, re represent those narratives as a graph, those subjects that receive it, this schizophrenia diagnosis six months in, uh, later, they were already uh, uh, narrating their uh, stories with low connectedness when we represent it as a graph. When we use it, those connectedness measurements uh, to correlate them with the negative uh, pen to tail, we had uh, a very uh, strong correlation with those negative symptoms uh, with an R square of 0.88. And then we defined this disorganization index using uh, two kinds of narratives and combining some uh, connectedness measurements. And we use it only this um, disorganization index to be predictive of this diagnosis using only the narratives during the first appointment. And we could predict the schizophrenia diagnosis and also the severity of negative symptoms with a very high accuracy, more than 90% accuracy. And uh, also with a collaboration uh, with uh, Thomas, Tom John Spencer and his group, we had access uh, to this um, data also collected with uh, English native speakers. And uh, as you can see here, we applied this uh, not only during the first uh, episode, psychotic episode, but also uh, they applied it during um, the clinical high risk of psychosis and they follow up those uh, subjects at the clinical high risk uh, to see who would uh, make a transition to psychosis or not. So as you can see here, uh, the first uh, psychotic episode is uh, really an important milestone. And when you compare this with all the, the group of clinical high risk and control groups, you can see that the speech is also uh, low, uh, less connected. But when you look inside this group and split it on this, those subjects that made a transition and those that didn't made a transition during the follow-up, what you can see is that those uh, subjects that had a transition were already uh, narrating uh, their stories using a uh, low connected uh, structure. So, uh, but what they're talking about matters or in fact this uh, structure that we measure through this narrative 
And what I, I, we saw uh, through this work is that, yes, some, um, some kinds of uh, topics are really informative, some are not at all. So uh, at the uh, first study, we asked the subject to report as a dream, and we could see a very different pattern emerging from the groups. But when we asked the subject to report us the day before the dream, uh, this narrative was uh, very linear uh, to, for, for all the groups. And, it, and we couldn't have this differentiation here in bipolar group or in the control group. Uh, and the second paper, when we look at those markers during the first uh, psychotic episode, we wanted to understand better why our dream narratives more informative. And we also uh, asked them, we showed them affective pictures from the YAPS database, a negative picture, uh, a positive picture with high arousal, also a neutral picture with high arousal. We asked them to report us uh, the, day, the, the day yesterday, the day before they had, and the oldest memory that they could recall at that moment. And as you can see here, the, be the best performance was obtained with the dream narrative followed by the affective narrative. So uh, doing that, we thought, okay, the negative narrative are more informative than the positive one, but uh, we have uh, for application use, we have some limits uh, to expose uh, participants to a negative image. So we studied a combination of three different positive uh, stimulus to, to have more uh, uh, words on those narratives. And combining those uh, three narratives, we look at into not only the structure, but also uh, the emotional content. Because what we saw before is that uh, what is in common on those uh, three uh, kinds of narratives? They are also uh, a stimulus that uh, evokes uh, uh, highly emotional information. Uh, dreams are known to be a very emotional memory uh, for, for a, a lot of participants. So in that sense, we wanted to understand better the associations between this uh, expression of emotion, and we use it for this uh, strategy uh, to, to count, uh, comparing with a dictionary, uh, to count the amount of uh, emotional words expressed through this narrative with uh, negative and positive emotions, and we calculate the proportion of those words uh, inside the narrative. And as you can see, first of all, we could replicate uh, the, the, the association, the multilinear association with a negative sense using only uh, positive image, images narratives. Uh, and also we could see that uh, those connected markers like uh, LCC, LSC, and the distance uh, from uh, random graphs were uh, associated with the proportion of uh, emo positive emotions that we expect to emerge from the stimulus but were not correlated with the negative emotions. Also, uh, it was interesting to see that it was an association exclusively uh, found on the, the group uh, uh, under the first uh, psychotic episode. So this association was not important for the control group. So uh, here we started to look at this as typical development and maybe uh, we have to look at uh, psychosis uh, having some milestones, important milestones to impact this kind of behavior. But uh, it, that is not only uh, the typical uh, developmental trajectory that it's important to look at. Uh, together with this typical trajectory, it's happening uh, developmental uh, trajectory as well. So you wanted to understand that. So we formulate this hypothesis. As schizophrenia is associated with a low connectedness in the narrative structure, maybe uh, while uh, children are at schools learning a new form of language like uh, uh, reading and writing habits, 
uh, and also uh, having all this uh, uh, different social cognition uh, with uh, their peers at schools, uh, we could see some uh, cognitive development associated with this uh, connectedness markers. So I went to the schools and I started to apply the same protocol uh, to uh, typical development children. Uh, here we studied the narratives of 76 subjects, six to eight years old in the second grade in public schools in Brazil. And we collected this data at the middle of the year and uh, associated the performance with the reading and math performance after uh, around six months. So we also uh, collected IQ measurements using a nonverbal strategy and also a performance on theory of mind tests using uh, the CELNN and the picture sequence test. So uh, in, uh, in a few words, what we found or what we expected uh, given our hypothesis. So those uh, children that had a low performance on IQ, theory of mind and reading abilities in the end of the year uh, were those ones that were performing the, their narratives using a, a small connected structure. Uh, and those, um, associations between uh, cognitive and academic performance were independent from each other. So we kept this investigation to see if it, it was related somehow with uh, memory performance. And we asked it uh, if it would have an association exclusively uh, with the verbal component of this memory, or if uh, visual spatial memory was also contributing for this, this model. And what we found is that exclusively uh, looking at short-term memory uh, through uh, this uh, component, this verbal component was associated with uh, this low connectedness graph. Uh, and uh, to, to have a wild look at those problems, we asked it, uh, what would be the most important factor to impact this uh, connectedness development? Would that uh, the age or nature would take, take this uh, job uh, from uh, just like the language that emerged uh, in a baby that learned how to talk uh, only by listening to adults talking, or would that require some kind of tutoring? And what are the impacts of formal education into that? So uh, we uh, 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 asked for uh, a very diverse population to uh, perform the same protocol. And we had uh, those typical subjects, and we could find this uh, change of pattern exclusively on the typical development subjects, but not on, on the psychotic group. So uh, we could find that uh, we, we change it from the pattern with low connectedness, but with uh, a lot of uh, short range repetitions to uh, a grown up, let me say, pattern of speech wh where we have uh, a highly connected uh, speech with a low uh, short range recurrences, a few uh, short range recurrences. And when we performed the correlations, what we found was that the typical um, group, uh, it had an association with age, with most of uh, the the, the, the graph attributes. But when we adjusted those correlations for educational factor, it uh, uh, lost its significance. Uh, when we uh, associated the, the, the graph measurements uh, with uh, educational level, we had a very strong uh, correlation. But when we adjusted for age, it tapped uh, its uh, significance. And performing a multilinear correlation, we could also find uh, a higher uh, coefficients for the educational factor. So uh, we cast this investigation by looking at uh, this developmental trajectory, applying this model 
So we predicted that those, uh, those changes would occur uh, more, uh, more, uh, in more accelerated way in the first beginning, and then it would tend to a maturation, uh, 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 getting a, a, a symptomatic value in a certain level. So we adopted this model to look at those uh, milestones and what we could find is that uh, it was required only to start to reading acquisition. So uh, the first grade was sufficient to diminish drastically the short range recurrence while to uh, keep uh, um, developing the connectedness measurement that is the marker associated with the diagnosis of schizophrenia, uh, this dynamic, this developmental dynamic is much lower. It takes uh, 13 years of education to mature. So in the end of the high school, we had this emergency at this asymptotical level. So uh, just to uh, get ensure that it's uh, the exposure to formal education, uh, we, we collected um, uh, 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 the, the same protocol with uh, an independent um, sample of illiterate adults and preschoolers. And what we found was that uh, we couldn't find uh, difference uh, on connectedness measurements between the illiterate adults group and the preschoolers, but we could find a different, uh, 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 important difference between the illiterate adults and the preschoolers with the literate adults, uh, showing that uh, the educational factor is what's most uh, strong here uh, to develop this uh, connectedness measurement. So um, we also wanted to see if uh, uh, reading and uh, educational, formal education plays such an important role. What happens uh, through the educate through the, the literature history? Uh, how does it develop uh, through uh, the history of literature? So we went to um, uh, study uh, using uh, also the the same graph measurement. Uh, a sample of uh, more than 700 texts expanding 5,000 years of literature reading. So we uh, use a text from uh, the Sumeria, the ancient Egypt, the uh, Hinduist, and uh, until the contemporary age, uh, to, and perform it the same uh, uh, strategy to, to see how it develops through time. And as we can see here, we also uh, found the same direction in this dynamic. So uh, while uh, the short range recurrence diminished drastically, the long range recurrence um, increased a long time ago, uh, splitting uh, those uh, two um, civilizations, two, two cultures here, the Syro Mesopotamia and the ancient Egypt, uh, to mature uh, around uh, the actual age. So uh, that's why maybe we can find, like uh, while reading the Greek or Roman uh, thinkers like Aristoteles, we can feel, have this feeling that we are actually very actual. Um, and it's uh, the same uh, kind of dynamics that a, a child passes while they are learning uh, this literature. So uh, it seems that the literated culture pushes uh, this uh, pattern uh, just as similar as uh, what we adopted on our book. So looking at uh, both uh, developmental perspectives, we can actually not looking at uh, one trajectory or another, we are looking at assumptions because uh, actually, what we found in our patients is the both things occurring at the same time. So uh, something that we are trying to look at is to perform this kind of analysis in our samples, uh, looking at at least both um, factors together to uh, 
to see how they're associated uh, with uh, those kinds of language markers to have this um, understanding. So here uh, in this uh, positive imagery groups, uh, we uh, study, uh, we had an association with uh, the disorganization index, uh, with the connectedness measurements uh, from the positive images narratives, and it was associated with uh, years of education and the negative symptoms with a very similar coefficient in a opposite direction, showing that while uh, formal education are acting for uh, some direction, the negative symptoms are uh, probably acting in another direction. And what we see in that behavior could be a compound of both factors. So uh, the idea is uh, to, to be inspired and in the use of very simple metrics that we could obtain, uh, just like in the pediatrics that we can collect high in weight and we can prevent some serial damages maybe in the near future we could collect uh, some speech markers uh, and uh, have a chance to change the developmental trajectory. So I want to acknowledge my supervisors and the formal lab that I built up all, all, uh, most of those works and also my near team um, there is actually with me on this path. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. That um, is absolutely fascinating. I think I echo some of the comments in the chat, which we'll get to later, is that um, the focus on historical texts is really, really cool. <laughs> I think in the interest of time, we might move to Valentina, if you um, have your slides ready, and then we'll keep questions um, when we get to Q&A. Yes. One second. Okay. Can you see? The slides? Yep, all good. Okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm very happy to join this um, exciting uh, group and network. And um, I have to confess that I was a bit surprised when Natalia contacted me and asked to talk about developmental perspective because. Uh, I've been working on language and specifically pragmatics in schizophrenia. I've been working on the development of pragmatic skills, uh, but I never bridged the two domains uh, together. Uh, but after some initial perplexity, I thought that this could be a, a good opportunity to uh, start uh, thinking about possible uh, connections. And of course, uh, these are still at the speculative stage, but uh, I'll share them uh, with you today in the final part of my talk. First, uh, I will start with a little bit of theory about uh, pragmatics. Um, there are a lot of definitions of pragmatics uh, in the literature. Um, there is a, a, a common view uh, according to which pragmatics represent the outmost layer of the linguistic and communicative competence and broadly refers to our ability to use language appropriately uh, in context. So our ability to have an appropriate conversation, to uh, construct and manage discourse appropriately. This goes back to the talk we just heard. But there's also a more focused uh, view of pragmatics uh, on which I will uh, especially talk about today, um, according to which pragmatic skills are those that allow us to integrate context and linguistic meaning uh, in such a way that we can understand what our interlocutors uh, mean in communication. So in other words, pragmatic skills are those skills that allow us to understand an expression such as the lawyer is a shark or that is a volcano and these are metaphors or that the sentence what a beautiful day after when it rains outside is ironic or that the utterance I have to work as a response to the question, are you coming to the party tonight, uh, means no. 
uh, this expression, these implicit meanings are very common in our everyday use of language. Uh, there are, they estimate that there are 50 metaphors per thousand words in ordinary discourse or 7% of our turns in a dinner conversation are ironic. So they're very common, yet the abilities uh, that I'm referring to, pragmatic abilities, are very vulnerable, are very fragile. They can be compromised in a large range of clinical populations, especially in schizophrenia. So what happens is that when an individual with schizophrenia hears uh, and is asked to explain the meaning uh, of an expression such as the lawyer is a shark, uh, he or she might explain it as uh, the, the lawyer swims very fast. Um, remarkably, these abilities are very fragile also from a developmental point of view. The ability to understand metaphors is a late achievement. Um, we have done a number of studies on kids who are nine, 10 years of age, and when they hear an expression like, that is a volcano, they might explain it as daddy vomits. So the similarity between these kind of answers uh, is quite remarkable and certainly needs some, uh, some attention. And um, I will talk about it at the end of the talk after describing a little bit the global pragmatic profiles of individuals with schizophrenia, how this impact functioning and quality of life and how, can we, uh, how we can restore and train these abilities. Uh, let me start this uh, more specific part by saying that uh, pragmatics is considered one of the uh, most uh, obviously disordered areas of language in schizophrenia. There is a very nice review by Covington and colleagues, uh, which said indeed that pragmatics is compromised even when structural aspects of language looks pretty much uh, fine. Uh, this was well known uh, by clinicians. Uh, I mean, in Kreppel, in Bloiler already, we find descriptions uh, of uh, disordered language in terms of tangentiality, poverty of speech, concretism that are hinting at the same phenomena. So why describing something that was already known in new terms with this linguistic perspective and pragmatic perspective? Uh, well, the advantage of adopting a linguistic point of view on uh, uh, this kind of uh, disturbances is first of all, from the point of view of assessment, because it offers us a theoretical framework that we can use to offer a more fine-grained description of the endophenotype of schizophrenia. And then there is also an advantage for rehabilitation, because again, we have a theoretical model that we can use to target these specific functions in a more uh, specific and focused way. So a few years ago, uh, together with the group of Marta Bosia in uh, Milano, we started investigating pragmatic skills in uh, uh, schizophrenia. This is the first uh, paper that we published in uh, 2016, where we conducted a global evaluation of pragmatic skills in individuals with schizophrenia. We used a novel assessment tool, novel back then, which is called APAX, which stands, which stands for Assessment of Pragmatic Abilities and Cognitive Substrates, uh, which is a test assessing both receptive and expressive pragmatic skills. It includes, uh, uh, just to give you an idea, an interview task, uh, where um, we rate uh, speech connectedness, coherence, uh, co co coherence, cohesion, but also informativeness uh, of the discourse. Uh, but there are also uh, tasks uh, assessing figurative language comprehension, for instance, metaphors, idioms, and, uh, and proverbs. Uh, um, let me just say that this test now is available, well, under uh, validation in several other languages. We developed it and standardized it in Italian, but now there is also the Hebrew version, the Flemish version, the Russian, French, German, English version, and get in touch if you're interested in using this version of or extending uh, the APAX to other languages. So, so we use this test in a sample of uh, 47 patients with chronic schizophrenia and 35 controls. And what we observed was a diffuse impairment. So the patient group had a lower performance in all tasks, especially in the interview and the figurative language tasks. 
And when we look at the scores with respect to the cutoff that were determined on the general population, what we observed was that 77% of patients were impaired. So they had a global uh, pragmatic scores that fell beyond uh, below the, uh, the cutoff. Uh, another thing we did in that study was to look at the relationship between impairment in pragmatics and impairment in other domains of cognition. So we assess um, neurocognition with the box, theory of mind with the Brune test, uh, psychopathology, et cetera. And then uh, we did some regressions to see which, which predictors uh, could explain pragmatic performance. Uh, and what we observed was that there were a number of them, including uh, IQ, including the theory of mind score, including the global uh, cognitive uh, uh, score. So what we concluded was that pragmatic impairment uh, is a core feature of schizophrenia because it affects more than 70% of patients. This is in line with other literature. It's present in chronic stabilized patients. It wides, it's widespread across different domains of pragmatics, expressive and receptive. And it shows diffuse correlation with other domains of cognition without a complete overlap. In a, a number of studies that follow, what we looked at was concretism more specifically, concretism in clinical terms, but impairment in figurative language understanding in pragmatic terms. And we capitalize on the distinction that pragmatics does, theoretical pragmatics does, between metaphors, idioms, and proverbs. Metaphors are more creative expressions, such as my lawyer is a shark, while idioms are more lexicalized and fixed expressions, like break the ice and proverbs are also fixed expression but they have the special feature that they convey some well-known truths social norm or moral concerns so they echo some social values and so uh, in this study that we published in 2020 we uh, basically use a two per three design so we compare the three types of figurative expression as assessed through different tasks either multiple choice or verbal explanation because we hypothesize that also the task format plays an important role. We had a sample of 47 patients, and again, we assessed them for a number of abilities and results show that indeed concretism is quite a nuanced phenomenon. While patients were impaired all over in all tasks, uh, their performance especially drop in the verbal explanation of proverbs, uh, showing that indeed these social norms that proverbs echo represent uh, something especially uh, challenging for individuals with schizophrenia. We went uh, far, more far in a further study that is in preparation where we decided to focus on concretism in metaphor specifically, comparing expressions such as some cooks are barrel. These are physical metaphors that refer to physical and, and um, let's say behavioral characteristics uh, of the topic and mental metaphor, things like some politicians are peacock that refer to uh, psychological characteristics uh, of the topic. Um, we created a task that is called physical and mental metaphor task that exists both for adults and for kids. We'll go back to that later. We assess, we use this task in a sample of 58 patients with uh, schizophrenia. And overall, uh, patients were more impaired, um, were impaired compared to controls in all types of metaphor, both types of metaphor. But what is especially interesting is the difference between physical and mental metaphors. For physical metaphors, like some cooks are barrel, uh, there was the same probability of providing a physical answer in patients and controls as so correct answers. While for mental metaphors, there was a much lower probability of providing a mental metaphors in the patient's group. So basically, it seems that mental metaphors are especially attuned to capture uh, concretism. And moreover, there was a stronger relationship with theory of mind for mental metaphors in patients only. So again, this hints at the nuance, nuances of concretism. In uh, seen from a linguistic point of view. But one, my question, whether this is important for patients functioning and quality of life, why assessing irony comprehension, metaphor comprehension, humor comprehension in patients, does it matter? 
uh, you know that there's a lot of research on what are the predictors of quality of life and functioning in schizophrenia and a well known and common models is the one you see in the slide here by Schmidt and colleague 2011 where cognition is seen as the main predictor of daily functioning with the mediation of theory of mind. So in this study that we published uh, last year in neuropsychology, uh, what we did was basically to add a box to this model. We added the box referring to pragmatics. Uh, the study was conducted on a sample of 100 patients with schizophrenia, which were assessed for uh, pragmatics, quality of life, cognition, and theory of mind. And what happened is that when we add pragmatics uh, in the model, not only the increased, uh, the explained variance increased Jesus. But also pragmatics turns out to be a more important factor in influencing the relationship, in mediating the relationship between cognition and daily functioning. So definitely pragmatics seems to be something that deserves uh, some attention in assessment, but also in, uh, uh, in treatment. And that's the reason why in the last year we have been working on uh, a training program targeting specifically pragmatic skills. And it was striking that there was no randomized control trial uh, on rehabilitation of pragmatic and communicative skills in schizophrenia. There were a few isolated studies, but with some methodological limitations. So, uh, so we took the challenge of constructing uh, a novel intervention program and we use theory. Uh, remember, I'm a linguist, so that's what I can do best. Uh, we use theory, pragmatic theory, to uh, build, to shape an intervention program that basically uses narrative prompts where there are some communicative mismatches to restore uh, the lost pragmatic rule. So for instance, uh, patients are presented with a story where there is a character who utters a metaphor such as the lawyer is a shark and there is another character who doesn't understand and say something like why he has no thing. And we try to stimulate the awareness of the problem in patients and via this we try to learn uh, uh, pragmatic, uh, pragmatic rules. This uh, training, which is called Pragmacom, the Pragmatics of Communication, um, a last 13 session of approximately 40 minutes one, uh, 40 minutes uh, each. And we use it uh, in, uh, um, in two groups, of course. One was administered the Pragmacom and the other was administered an active control uh, training um, consisting in conversation, reading a newspaper, but without an explicit focus on pragmatic rules. And patients were tested uh, pre-training, post-training and a three month follow up uh, for pragmatic skills, uh, for uh, using the APEX, but also the physical and mental metaphor test that I mentioned for abstraction using the puns and five item and for quality of life and functioning. These are the results. Uh, basically in the APAX, so in the global pragmatic skills, we observe a better performance in the group treated uh, with the pragmacum, which is in blue, both at post-training and a three-month follow-up compared to the group uh, treated with the control training, which is in pink. Uh, there was also a significant improvement uh, in the pragmacum uh, group compared to the control group in metaphor comprehension. Uh, there was an impairment uh, in abstraction, in abstract thinking, uh, immediately post-training. Uh, this was not maintained as uh, follow-up because also the control group improved. Uh, but most importantly, there was an improvement in quality of life in the pragmacon group that was not present in the control group. It was not visible immediately after training, but it showed up at follow up after patient had enough time to improve social relationship and uh, change, uh, let's say, performance in, uh, uh, in daily living. So pragmatics overall seems key to gain a better description of the endophenotype of schizophrenia and also to shape intervention program that can improve patients' uh, quality of life. Uh, my question now, and there's a switch in my talk here, is can we gain further insight by looking at pragmatic development? Well, um, there are uh, two main aspects of the development of pragmatic skills in typical children that I would like to highlight uh, because I think they may have implication for our study of communication and pragmatics in schizophrenia. 
Uh, the first one is that pragmatics is a late achievement. And what you see here in the slide is actually a screenshot uh, of one of the slides of Daniel uh, Matthews, who gave recently a talk at the X Prague Wine series uh, um, on the development of pragmatic skills. She's a great expert on it, and she's finishing a book specifically on this topic, where she basically uh, explained how. Uh, pragmatics developed in several steps. In the first years of life, pragmatics is just joint attention. Uh, it matures slowly and definitely figurative language understanding, the kind of pragmatics I was referring to in the previous part of my talk is a late achievement. Uh, we have done a number of studies on the development of metaphor skills, for instance, uh, in middle childhood and in preschoolers. Um, now I'm mentioning a study we published in 2019 in Journal of Child Language, where we use the physical and mental metaphor tasks that I already uh, mentioned. So there are metaphors like that is a volcano, dancer are butterflies, and kids are asked to explain the meaning of this expression. And we use it in kids age from nine uh, uh, to 12 years. And what we observed was a clear developmental trend indicating that kids who were uh, 12 were better than kids who were 11 and who were better than kids who were nine and 10. So definitely metaphor comprehension is not mature until late uh, childhood. Uh, in a study that is ongoing now, uh, we developed a version of the PMM for uh, younger kids. And so we are testing preschoolers in metaphor comprehension, this time with a multiple choice task instead of with verbal explanation. And again, we are observing a developmental trend from kids age three to kids, to kids age six. So uh, they're far from being early, kids are far from being early birds uh, with metaphor understanding. And this holds also for other aspects uh, of pragmatic skills. So the question that I would like to ask now, and I leave this as one of the points of uh, discussion, is whether this late acquisition pattern of pragmatic skills in typical development is somehow related to impairment of pragmatics in schizophrenia. We already saw that there is a suggestive similarity in the answers that patients give when they have to explain a metaphor, kids give when they have to explain uh, a metaphor, kids who are nine or 10. Uh, this might suggest that patients stop at the childhood competence level, but after talking extensively with Marta Bozia, the psychiatry I, I uh, work with, uh, who has more experience than me on, on these aspects, uh, uh, she taught me that this is unlikely. More likely what happens is that pragmatics, uh, as the other skills, uh, weakly develop uh, in schizophrenia and has a, then a drastic onset, uh, um, a drastic decay at onset. But still, since pragmatics is acquired late, it may be an area of possible marked, especially marked weakness throughout development in individuals who later develop psychosis. And this idea recalls somehow what Jacobson was saying in the 40s, uh, referring to aphasia, that what is acquired later is lost later. He was referring to linguistic categories, for instance, in the phonological domain, but this may, may apply here too. Hence, what I would like to uh, suggest is that pragmatics might be especially important, might have some screening importance to monitor uh, early diagnosis. The second element of the acquisition of pragmatic skills in typical development uh, that I would like to highlight because it might be relevant for schizophrenia is that pragmatics uh, in development is strictly tied to other skills. What you see now is uh, the picture proposed by Snow and Douglas uh, of pragmatic acquisition, where pragmatics is seen as a cup of competence uh, fed by language function, executive function, social cognition, on a platform of social and environmental context, okay? This goes back 
back to what Natalia was saying about the effects of context, uh, literacy, school, education, etc. Well, for pragmatics, there's much more. It's really a cup of competence. We have data on, uh, on this cup of competence, uh, focusing especially on the role of social cognition. We have been working a lot on the relationship between pragmatics and social cognition in development. For instance, uh, we have done this longitudinal study uh, testing the association between metaphor understanding and theory of mind in middle childhood. Uh, we had kids age eight and nine. They were tested uh, at T1 and at T2 uh, one year later uh, for metaphor and for theory of mind uh, and for some control variables. And what we observe is clearly a bidirectional relationship between these skills. So metaphor skills at T1 predicts uh, theory of mind and global inferential skills at T2 and vice versa. And going a, even a bit more social, we also tested the relationship between metaphor understanding and uh, um, social uh, popularity, social relationship. Uh, in this study that we published last year in Infant and Child Development, uh, we tested 161 kids age nine for metaphor understanding and for peer popularity. This is done through the method of peer nomination. So you ask kids who are the most popular and the least popular kids in a classroom. And what we found was that lower metaphor understanding at T1 predicted higher rejection rate at T2 and also vice versa. So individuals who are less good with metaphors uh, become less popular, probably because conversation with them is more boring. And vice versa, individuals who are uh, less popular become even worse with metaphor at T2, probably because they have less opportunity to practice their pragmatic skills. So given this cup of competence, which is especially strong uh, uh, for what concerned the relationship between pragmatics and Tommy in development, my question for you and for the debate today is, is the link between pragmatics and Tom and the social world in development indicative of the cognitive profile of schizophrenia? Does it tell us something about the cognitive profile of schizophrenia? Uh, remember that uh, I mentioned in, uh, that in our first study, the 2016 study, we found that uh, pragmatic scores were predicted by a number of skills, including IQ, uh, theory of mind, and the global cognitive profile. And note that this link between pragmatics and other skills in, is less strong in other conditions, especially in neurological condition. We have done studies, for instance, on ALS, on amyotrophic lateral sclerosis with the apex task, and we don't find the same strong relationship between pragmatics and other domains. So what I would like to suggest is that perhaps there's a sort of regression in schizophrenia to the developmental stage, the cup of competence stage, also as a possible compensatory strategy. And so developmental patterns might be key to better understand the cognitive architecture and the cognitive dysfunction that we observe in schizophrenia. But these, of course, are uh, uh, speculations that I would like to discuss with you um, today. I hope I managed to give you an overview of the global pragmatic profile, which is definitely, um, in my view, uh, worth uh, some attention. I would like to thank my collaborators uh, at USE that you see here in the first row, but also uh, other collaboration outside my institution, in particular, Marta Bosia, whom I already mentioned, the psychiatrist in Milano, but also Serena Lecce for uh, the development Mental psychologist in Pavia for all the developmental studies, and uh, George Arcara, with whom we develop uh, the APAX task. For those of you who are interested in pragmatics, we in Pavia we are hosting the next XPRAG uh, conference in uh, uh, September, and uh, it, it will soon be possible to uh, register. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Valentina. I think you've, you've posed really, really interesting questions there, um, which I think will lead to a very fruitful discussion. I think at this point, I'm just going to invite the two speakers to um, make their final comments. Um, Natalia, do you want to begin? Thank you, Eric. Thank you, uh, Valentina. I, I just wanted to, to share with you one slide because uh, this is what I found it was really exciting about uh, Valentina's work and it inspired me a lot. 
is this one. I don't know if you are uh, aware of this book uh, from Stokes, uh, the, the, the Pasteur Quadrant. Uh, it shows that uh, science and science production can consider uh, the use of uh, what is newly uh, uh, achieved or can uh, just quest for a fundamental understanding uh, and uh, uh, applying more this knowledge for the basic research. But what I see um, in the set of knowledge that Valentina uh, brings to us is this uh, quadrant here, is I use inspired uh, by the basic research. Uh, it follows the path to understand what pragmatic is uh, and uh, what uh, it has uh, into account of uh, human behavior uh, during development, during uh, um, some kind of mental suffering, and goes through uh, the observation until the, the intervention basis. So uh, I would love uh, to hear more thoughts about this and how we can gain uh, with adopting this kind of strategy to look at both uh, gains that we can have with new knowledge. Uh, thank you, Natalia. This yeah. is, a, this is a, a epistemological yeah. comment, uh, I would say, you know, about uh, based yeah. research and theory-inspired mm -hmm. research. And, uh, um, and for sure, uh, I do base uh, mm -hmm. uh, research, but always with an eye uh, towards, mm -hmm. you know, more um, useful uh, uh, application. Uh, let me say uh, um, something about uh, your talk and also ask a, a question, uh, perhaps too, mm -hmm. um, directly. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, first I was very fascinated with uh, the speech uh, graph uh, method. I didn't know it well, uh, and I had the opportunity mm -hmm. of uh, reading uh, more uh, about it uh, in the uh, past days. Um, that looks very powerful uh, to me, but of course it's just a method, uh, a window on, on something. So um, we could talk about the methodology a lot, but uh, what I would like to do, given also my background, uh, is to talk a bit more about what you are measuring with it. Mm -hmm. and, and speech connectedness, okay? This phenomenon of, of speech connectedness. And what I think, um, what strikes me, um, it's that throughout the studies that you presented, you show that speech connectedness uh, is not just the result of something else, but it seems to have an autonomous profile. For instance, in your study on, on kids only, you show that a speech connectedness is predictive of reading and math skills, etc. after controlling for IQ and theory of mind, okay? Uh, and also, uh, when you said that it's resistant to education in, in patients, mm -hmm. you also seems to indicate that it's something uh, autonomous, autonomous. And I'm saying this because um, it happened many times to me while talking with clinicians about pragmatic mm -hmm. skills, for instance, that they were saying, oh, but that's just IQ or but that's just theory mm -hmm. of mind. OK, while I never saw a perfect overlap between this domain and they might say this mm -hmm. also for uh, discourse organization, which in a way is part of pragmatics if we adopt the broad mm -hmm. definition of it. So I think that your studies really indicate that there's something in discourse that it's not fully absorbed and described by the other categories that are more commonly, uh, more commonly used. Um, and going back to the uh, development uh, perspective that is at the center of our attention today, uh, in your uh, fascinating study on the big court where you had both children and adults and that uh, with psychosis, etc. Uh, basically, it, it seems to me that um, you said or you wrote it also in the paper that in patients you didn't you didn't observe the same dynamics uh, in this course. So mm -hmm. are you suggesting really that the patient stopped? at the childhood stage uh, or mm -hmm. do you think that there is a regression because 
to me as an outsider, that's a key question. And I would like to understand it mm -hmm. more clearly uh, from, from you because you've done this big longitudinal study. So you, you might have uh, insight on it. So that's my question number, number one. <laughs> Thank you, Valentina. Actually, uh, it's, uh, I, I will ask uh, to answer your question together with Limonji questions that you wrote it. Uh, oh, yeah. because I can uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the assumptions between, uh, behind the methods and then uh, talk about those factors. And it's not, it's not by chance that you have this feeling because I, I'm having this feeling. I'm trying to express this through the papers and through the talks because actually I don't have a clear answer for what is happening on this, but I have some uh, thoughts about it. So when uh, we decided uh, to, to analyze data like this, uh, the assumption that we adopted was not based on linguistics or on um, any kind of theory behind it. It was inspired on the phenomenology, on the description of what happened uh, during the formal thought disorders that we had those uh, fragmented speech, the derailment, all uh, those kinds of uh, descriptions lead us to, to the sense that somehow this word trajectory that you can uh, access only through language. Uh, so the assumption is kind of that, Limunti, uh, are we, we are trying to uh, mimic uh, what was described, uh, what was uh, 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 the psychiatrists are trying to say when they listen to this kind of behavior and feel that something is getting out of the root. So we adopted uh, mathematical models to see if this trajectory is actually disrupted somehow. And that's why we don't make any pre-processing of those kinds of words we use all the words that are spontaneously spoken by, by the participants. We wanted to see how those words recur uh, spontaneously during the speech. So uh, in what time do they recur um, stop words or content words? It doesn't matter. What does matter? It's only the recurrence. And then uh, we adopted this very agnostically to see how this kind of behavior emerged, uh, not adopting uh, any theory behind that. Of course, it's an analogy to access thoughts. And I agree with uh, uh, this assumption has a lot of limitations and we can talk about it. But what we see here is this expressive behavior on language. So how the, uh, in what step does the words uh, uh, are repeated and recurred uh, and we do, uh, we, we do not use reference or uh, do not translate what kind of meaning does a pronoun, for example, are trying to represent here. We, we don't make any pre-processing and any assumption behind that. So, um, Looking at uh, uh, the data as it is, what we found is that, of course, that will be a lot of different factors. Uh, it matters what you ask. It matters uh, how do you ask. It matters uh, when do you ask. Uh, so this developmental trajectory uh, that call it caught our attention is that what happens during the first stages of psychosis that we are trying to reach out with those kinds of measurements. We are looking at different factors playing important roles at the same time. Not only uh, the pathological uh, trajectory, but also uh, developmental trajectory is occurring at the same time. So um, trying to disentangle this, uh, trying to answer your question, Valentina. What I have uh, in, in in this uh, observation is that if nothing is getting out of what's expected through this developmental trajectory, it will have an impact 
from social uh, environment and social factors. Uh, but when you have some kind of cognitive decline or some kind of mental suffering, this precedes this uh, developmental route or this developmental trajectory that was going on and somehow uh, diminishes this impact and make it a different trajectory. So we have, um, if I can show you, I'll show, uh, share again my screen just to share with you another slide, not only talking about psychosis, but talking about Alzheimer's uh, disease and typical aging. So we apply it, uh, the, the, uh, a similar uh, protocol uh, with a typical aging sample and Alzheimer's uh, disease group as well. And uh, they were narrating a story based on a, a, um, a sequence of pictures uh, showing a story based on a dog, something like that. And what we could solve when we uh, transcribed all the words and represented as a graph is that uh, what we expected, uh, the group that had Alzheimer's disease uh, performed uh, uh, a less connected narrative compared to the control group. But what called our attention was that um, the associations, the, 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 the Cognitive basis uh, of this, um, this measurements were different between the groups. Uh, in one hand, during the typical aging, episodic memory was related to connectedness. So as you can see here, this attribute of graph connectedness is associated with uh, the performance on episodic memory. So the more the subject was able to recall details um, and inform those details uh, uh, to, to the interviewer, uh, the more uh, connected was this, um, this narrative. It seems that when they are planning the narrative, they are introducing a lot of different information inside that narrative. And this uh, gives this sense of uh, a very connected narrative. So uh, lexical diversity, vocabulary should play an important role uh, in the typical waging or the typical sample. But at um, the Alzheimer's disease, something's going on uh, and precedes the episodic memory performance is the semantic memory. So it's the ability to name objects that it's actually uh, associated with this connectedness. So before being able to uh, recover details, uh, those participants were um, uh, actually, they had an impact on naming uh, simple objects. And this seems to precede uh, the exotic memory uh, performance that they had. So uh, for now, what I think is that in different contexts, uh, different factors could play an important role uh, at the same measurement. So uh, that's why I think we really need to understand this uh, in a cultural and language diverse sample to get the sense as it doesn't have any linguistic basis on the metric so we have to make this translation. What are you looking at? Is that pragmatic? Is that uh, synthetic? I don't know. I, I don't know yet. Uh, and I will love to do this with this opportunity. That's why I'm, I'm here very open to talk about those factors and those ideas, because I think that they are really open at this moment right now. Yeah. Um, that just can I say a very quick thing that, as a linguist, and then I leave it to the mm -hmm. open debate? Well, what are we looking at? Pragmatics, etc. When you look at discourse, everything is together. That's why yeah. uh, you know there's syntax, there's syntax, uh, there's semantics, there's pragmatics. So mm -hmm. um, that's. 
complex. Mm -hmm. It's language overall, yeah. but I'll shut up and I see that there are hands, so I'll leave it. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. Like it's hard to isolate all these things. But I think um, we'll go to Lena, who has a question. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thanks, Valentina and Natalia. This was really enjoyable. I enjoyed every minute of this. These two talks. Thanks a lot. I mean, one general comment is it'll be very interesting to see how um, development of structural elements of language, like the work that Natalia you are doing, things like LSE and graph. How does that track the development of pragmatics as well uh, in, in people mm -hmm. at risk? Of I think it'd be a very interesting question. Um, we really need the Varvatel and data sets to answer such, such questions. There's just a general comment, but I have two specific questions. One for you, Valentina. Um, you know, the, the whole question of um, uh, pragmatics and, and metaphorical comprehension and production also uh, relies uh, at least to some extent with my limited knowledge on how people learn spontaneous imitation uh, as you know uh, when you grow up you, you spontaneously imitate what other people do you also imitate the language the linguistic imitation also is a developmental feature now the, is this an important uh, aspect of um, conditions where uh, pragmatics is disturbed like for example in autism there is an imitation problem we know about that uh, is it something that you've come across often? I think the real question is, by improving spontaneous imitation, can we really improve pragmatic problems that we see in uh, patients with schizophrenia? What, what is your thoughts on that? That's a wonderful question. And um, <clears throat> there's, uh, there's a lot of debate on the role of uh, imitation in language development. Uh, if you adopt a more let's say Chomsky and generativist view, uh, there the idea is the uh, so-called poverty of the stimulus argument. So they argue that even if imitation might have some role, that's definitely not enough because mm -hmm. you're not exposed to all possible syntactic structures that uh, one can create uh, and it doesn't capture the creativity of, of language. Now, applied to metaphor, I would say that this is even more extreme because while some routines are important and you certainly learn by exposure, uh, it's not simply imitation that can uh, explain uh, that can explain this. Um, certainly education and school uh, has a role uh, because we experience, for instance, metaphors. We kids experience metaphors by reading literary text. Um, that's one kind of experience they have with metaphors, but that's definitely not enough to cover all possible creative uses of language. So a deprived environment uh, would definitely impact negatively. But I think that improving imitation would not be enough to improve metaphor comprehension. Indeed, we have a training for developing, uh, for typical developing mm -hmm. kids, uh, a metaphor training, uh, which is in a way similar to the pragmacon that I mentioned, although we are less explicit in learning the rule because you know, for patients, you have to restore something that was lost or at least weakly developed, uh, uh, going back to the issue we were discussing earlier. While in kids, the ability is developing, you just have to strengthen it. Uh, so we have this, um, this training for kids, which, is, which tries to stimulate generalization to other contexts, and it's not simply based on, uh, uh, on imitation. But certainly an environment, a good environment is important. Uh, that's great. Th thanks for that thought. It's very fascinating. We we are going to start. Uh, we don't. I don't have my PhD student here, Emmanuel. He was about to join. He couldn't join for some reason. But he's going to start looking at uh, a relationship between improving symmetrical, asymmetrical, spontaneous imitations, and hmm. uh, linguistic disorganization in general in in psychosis. It, it is not experimental, but some observational correlations uh, we will be able to find hopefully uh, between. Yeah. These as some pragmatic measure pre and post so we'll yeah, answer yeah. this question <laughs> so i have one more question but i'm not going to ask you natalia i will catch up with you later on that because there are other questions and i will uh, move myself from the stage thank you okay thank you thanks lena i think um i'll go to the chat and i think um i'm gonna ask the question by luca and one of sunny's questions together i think sunny's left the 
um, the session because she yeah. has something else to do. But I think it was particularly, um, Natalia, in relation to your um, talk about the historical texts and the notion mm -hmm. of, you know, the medium of writing, because obviously, you know, is, is there a difference between the writing system, uh, system mm -hmm. as well as the fact that, you know, in, in certain contexts, you know, the recording of this information might have to do more with accounting than actually, you know, the fluidity of text and things about mm -hmm. it. And so what your thoughts on that were? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Luke and Sunny. Uh, for that question. I'm thank you, Sunny, and for Sona this thanks because I know she will uh, watch the video afterwards. So uh, this is a very important question. And actually um, we have like this backstage stories about the papers. And this was a very interesting backstage uh, history about this paper because what happened uh, when you have a uh, research group very enthusiastic and trying to uh, keep researching and don't have any funds as we had here in Brazil, it was cut. It, so we uh, try it to be creative and get data in another uh, sense. So we started to look at those historical perspectives without uh, having a historian with us. So we were also very naive on doing this. And uh, what we adopted on the sense was a very wild view uh, to look at how the words were related to each other uh, and not relating to the content of the text, only looking at the structure. And of course, there is a lot of limitations to doing that. But uh, to adopting this, we can actually uh, get a common ground of different texts throughout the historical time. So uh, for uh, to be able to compare texts with a very different uh, ways that they, they were wrote it, uh, so we, we adopted a transliteration in English for each text. So actually we are not looking at the the cuneiform writing we are looking at the uh, an english transliterate text based on that um on, on, on that historical piece so and also for the so when when we are talking about this we are actually doing something that is very naive and we had a long history of reviewing this uh for about four years of revision of this paper. It changed a lot. We added a lot of uh, different controls to that. But what we could see is that when we adopted the same common ground, we actually neglected those important factors that are, what are they talking about? What are uh, they writing about? It's different to you to write like Sunny pointed, and a lot of uh, the, the initial historical pieces and why we started to write stuff was to write um, what we have. So it was accountability. It was counting how many uh, properties that someone had. But we had also from this ancient text, uh, very prosodic text, and it was the, the major part of our text. We look at uh, more for uh, texts like the, the death book or some uh, uh, pieces, historical pieces, written as a papiro, um, I don't know how to say it in English, uh, but wrote it in a paper, a very ancient paper that in Portuguese we call it papiro. I don't know how to say in English. Sorry, um, and and we try it to make our best effort to to take into this account. We analyze the poetry and the songs uh, in a very different group because we we knew that that structure it something in between the orality and the writing text. It's it is literature, but it's also uh, oral. You know, so I'm sharing a lot my screen, but just to make uh, it more comprehensible, I added here a slide 
with all the groups that we we try to look at. So uh, we studied together uh, those uh, more modern texts. So those actual texts, it's from uh, uh, the the 1800 uh, BC. Uh, until today, and three actual texts are from the Bronze Age, so ancient Egypt and uh, uh, Sumeria uh, civilization, uh, the most of them. And as you can see here, uh, we uh, plotted uh, this distribution only based on the short range recurrence. Here, just for to to uh, illustrate, we uh, made it uh, here the lowest point and here the highest point. And here is the long range recurrence, the LSC, going from the lowest to the highest. So as we can see here, the post actual text, those transliterations, seems to have uh, the lowest values of short range recurrences. Uh, and the highest values of long range recurrences. Um, and here, uh, as you can see, are the poetry that it's actually uh, has the same lowest point as the post actual text on the short range recurrence, that it's actually repeating the same word association. Uh, but uh, the size of the largest strongly connected components, it's very uh, low because you are writing this on uh, small pieces of uh, narrative. It's very different from what we found on the Bronze Age text that were also uh, prosodic, but had much more short range repetitions and had a lower value on the long range uh, uh, recurrence. And um, it, it is here together with uh, the narrative from the literate children or illiterate adults and different from uh, the narrative from literate adults after the, the 12 years of education. So after me, uh, uh, high school. And uh, the start point that seems to, to have the structure, uh, we analyze it from the preschoolers narrative that has much more uh, short range recurrence and a smaller, uh, larger, strongly connected component. And I wanted to call attention for uh, the cultural uh, narratives here. Uh, collected from highly educated uh, Meridian adults. Why are Meridian? Because they have this different cultural uh, uh, be background. It's a, a oral tradition. They don't have this kind of influence from a literary culture, but they're actually uh, training uh, their adults and specifically the leaders to uh, have to memorize their uh, an entire tradition uh, from uh, orality. So they have to reproduce those tales, those stories in, in a very uh, um, similar way through all the years and passing this generation through generation. So this training is very different from what we get when we have a physical um, object to reproduce our cultural memory. What I think today is that somehow when we develop it, this technology that we call writing, we started to uh, have a different relationship with our verbal memory we have uh, a way to restore our culture. And that culture is maybe leading uh, the development on this way, having a, a low short range repetition, but also but adding a lot of information together in a, a long uh, uh, space of long term, uh, long range recurrence. It's very different to uh, the pressure that we have 
when you have to memorize all the cultural values uh, uh, from the beginning. So the training is very different. And it seems uh, what, I, I, what I think, and I would love to, to chat more about it, is that um, this uh, leads to a more a mnemonic uh, rules, uh, adding more repetition to, to be easy to recollect this memory and uh, having small packages of uh, this information. So it's more like this seems that literary education pathway uh, seems to increase the range of this recurrence and uh, the oral educational pathway seems to decrease this range of recurrence. Um, and so far it's what we get, but it has a lot of uh, uh, different factors that may play a role uh, to, to understand this kind of uh, development. Yeah, thank you, Natalia. I think you've you've got a lot of these background slides, and they're really, really helpful. Um, Federico, you have a question. Yes, thank you. I am a PhD student working with Valentina on speech analysis in schizophrenia, so I have a question. I, I was uh, impressed by the graph analysis, and I think it's very interesting and powerful, as Valentina said. So I have a couple of questions and curiosities concerning this uh, method. And the first one is a very small curiosity. Uh, I'd like to know how you generate graphs in, in general with, the, with a software or with a specific method. And the second question is uh, how easy or difficult would be to implement graph analysis in clinical practice, in your opinion? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Federico, for your questions. Um, so, uh, yes, it is uh, actually it's very easy nowadays to, to do it. If you wanna, we can chat afterwards. I can um, uh, uh, show to you how to use it. We developed this uh, app. It's a software actually written in Java. It's pretty old nowadays. It wasn't it <laughs> when it was built, it, but it works. So you just have to put uh, as an input a text file that uh, you can create a very regular one, a point .txt file, and with your narrative, it uh, will understand that each set of letters between the spaces are a different node. So each different word is a different node, okay? And it plots an edge, a direct edge, uh, on the temporal sequence. So it keeps uh, following uh, the path. So there is a lot of um, different assumptions that you can get. So if you jump a line, it won't, uh, it, the, 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 the software won't recognize the, the edge between the last word used on the initial paragraph to the first word used on the second paragraph. So you can separate the components. So far, what we do is that we use it this um, uh, very spontaneous narrative. So we ask it, the subject to report us the narrative and we count the time. So if the time uh, isn't it enough to reach out at least 30 seconds to have at least a several amount of words to perform a graph, we uh, stimulate the subject to keep talking with a general stimulus. So just keep talking. And then we uh, transcribe this, um, this following uh, narrative in a second line because we understand that when you have to stimulate someone to keep talking, you're actually, this is, was not planned before, so it was not linked directly. So we have a first planet narrative and then a second planet narrative and that so on, okay? Um, but we can chat more in details about it and we can, uh, I, I can share with you the software as well. Uh, I will, this is, uh, this is what it is about. Uh, the dispersion psychosis, it's about uh, collaboration and uh, change. Thank you. 
Yes, method. I was very curious because I thought that uh, you need to perform a greater amount of preprocessing or a, a sort of tagging before giving the input to the software. No. So it's even I, easier I than all I thought. The suffering, I had all the suffering 10 years ago <laughs> in the initial <laughs> paper that I had to perform all the graphs in my hand, I draw in it. Uh, and then I translate it to a, 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 a computational um, algorithm, uh, but it was really, really hard. So at this first paper, this initial paper, we did some synthetical analysis, and actually we perform it um, using uh, as a node not only the word but also uh, uh, the 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 object or the verb or, or uh, the, the, the subject of the sentence, we perform like that. But then when we try it to automatize, it was really hard. So we adopted this agnostic view. So because also at psychotic stages, uh, when you look at those uh, synthetical relationships, sometimes it's not clear the referential meaning. So sometimes it's not clear if the patient is talking, uh, he just came out with a she or with a he, and you don't know uh, from who he's referring to, you know? And sometimes this kind of sense loses um, in, in the very initial detail. So we try to adopt a very naive perspective and a very agnostic perspective, and that's why we plot every word as a, a, a different node. An advantage of this is because it's uh, from theory, uh, language invariance. So we can um, use the same methods for different languages and see if uh, we had the same kind of results. Yes, thank you. So I guess that uh, uh, this answers also my Second question, which is how easy it to implement it in clinical practice on a daily practice? I think it's quite easy. Yes, it is. <laughs> it Thank doesn't you. rely on big corpora. It doesn't have any huge background to uh, transform like word embedding that you can have some issues with computational cost. It's very straightforward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Um, Marta, you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you. I'm Marta Bosia. I'm a psychiatrist and researcher at San Raffaele Milan, and I collaborate with uh, Valentina and Federico for a study on patients with schizophrenia. I also didn't know very well uh, your method, Natalia, and I was uh, really mm. uh, impressed. Um, as you pointed out, it is really useful for prediction in particularly critical stages for psychosis on the prediction for transition. And also you mentioned uh, at the end the data on Alzheimer and also the condition of mild cognitive impairment. So it is uh, useful to capture uh, before it is uh, too late for uh, rehabilitation and remediation. And this yeah. is really an important aspect, but I was uh, curious if uh, you used it also for monitoring the course of disease in patients already with a diagnosis, if you have some data on if these measures are dynamics and vary according to treatment response, can they be a market, a early marker of treatment response? Thank you very much for this question. Not yet. I, I couldn't reach out to conduct a, a long uh, longitudinal study with the same participants, not yet. Uh, as you can see, it's a very interdisciplinary group. I was the only psychiatrist at the group. My supervisors were from neuroscience and also from the physics. So it was uh, really hard to keep uh, the track with the same participants. But I, I think it is a very important question. I don't know yet if it is a stage um, or if, if those measurements are traced 
of the disease. If if those measurements are stable or if they do um, uh, 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 get together with the oscillation of symptoms. As it is associated with negative symptoms, I have a hypothesis that it must, most, must be stable as uh, some cognitive deficits seems to be at the, the psychosis and uh, when we are talking about psychosis. But I, I, wouldn't, um, I, I, I wouldn't take all my, or, or my, my uh, um, guess on that. I would be open it to, to look at some variations because sometimes some think it's leading another association. Maybe this association is not uh, very directly. So far, it seems to be. Uh, in this um, recent paper that is under revision, we look at it, um, how uh, education uh, could explain actually this, uh, inter this association between symptoms and uh, the, link the connectedness. And it doesn't matter. When we adjust the correlation, it doesn't change. It seems to be more directly related with the negative symptomatology. So mm -hmm. I would guess that it's quite a, a stable measurement. But you also had a um, sample of bipolar patient, but uh, um, in the work you presented that those were bipolar with uh, psychotic symptoms at the moment. Yes. Do you have data on eutemic bipolar disorder? It was bipolar mm. disorder with psychotic symptoms. Yeah, and you don't have that data on the bipolar disorder no, during no, the. No, not yet. No, okay. No. Because that actually, would have helped also, at transfer. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank but you. Actually, uh, connectedness doesn't, uh, it's not um, actually uh, the best measurement to distinguish between bipolar disorder and the control group. Actually, we are not able to distinguish between the both groups uh, very well. So I guess that we, we needed to add more uh, information to, to perform this analysis for bipolar disorder. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. I think, I think we're almost out of time, but I guess, um, Valentina, I think I'm going to read you the last question from the chat. I think Sunny, who was obviously here earlier, she talked a bit about you know, formal thought disorder symptoms relating to speech inefficiency. So things like tendentiality, perseveration versus um, the failure to convey intended messages. So things like incoherence and loss of goal. And she talked a bit about, you know, obviously they're all in, in, the, in Grice's maxims, they are pragmatic, you know, violations. But she talked a little bit about how incoherent speech obscures the M intent of discourse but inefficient speech may not. And just what were your thoughts on that bit? Yeah, uh, I, I've read this question. It's really very interesting. Um, mm. it, it, I know the Gratian part, but I'm not sure I know the items she's referring to, whether these are item of the uh, thought and language uh, scale of Andreas and yeah, I don't know from where. Interest, then, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So probably, uh, uh, and I would, I don't remember specifically how tangentiality and incoherence uh, differ. Uh, because in Gratian term, one could argue that, um, you know, uh, uh, tangentiality is a violation of the relevance uh, maxim and also partly of the quantity maxims, while incoherence uh, might be a violation of the maxim of manner, uh, which uh, is be clear and not be obscure. So uh, ultimately, I think that the intent of the speaker, the M meaning in Gratian term is obscure in all cases. And, and more, most likely it's 
different shades of the conversational rules that are violated. Uh, like in one case, it's uh, relevance, and in the other case, it's more clearness. But of course, maxims are not so clear cut. And very often, when one is violated, another one is violated too. And especially relevance and quantity are very often violated. It is interesting, though, uh, that going back to um, to development, um, there's a clear, uh, there are clear steps in the development of the maxims. And so kids very early on develop a sensitivity to the quality maxims. So they understand the difference between true and false information. While the last one to develop is the quantity one. So understanding the amount of information that is appropriate in a certain discourse is quite difficult for kids. They don't understand very well what is under informative and over informative. So in that case, there again, we see that probably the most uh, vulnerable one uh, in patients, which is this quantity, uh, is also one that is acquired very late in, uh, uh, in kids. I never thought about it, and it's, it's interesting. But going back to Sunny's uh, question, I would rather frame it uh, in the um, relevance versus manner uh, difference, but I should have a look at the Andrea's um, items uh, more specifically to make this distinction, and I will, and perhaps I will email Sunny. Yeah, yeah. No, I Thanks. think that makes sense, and I think it ties into what we said earlier about the fact that speech happens all together, and it's really hard to have a clear distinction. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, given on that point and looking at the time, I think we've had a very, very interesting chat today. I'd like to thank both of our speakers. And um, just for everyone, we'll be back here in three weeks time um, for the next um, seminar, which will be on automated linguistics and the analysis of um, symptoms and schizophrenia and psychosis. Um, so thank you again for joining us today. Um, recordings will be available thank on you. YouTube and I will tweet them out. But thank you again. And we will see you in a couple of weeks. Bye bye. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye bye. bye. bye.